Good morning. We welcome you all to the first session of the uh, 2020 annual conference. With me, uh, the session is chaired by Dr. Sanjeev Vijaykorn. The, our first session is on uh, cardiology. We have three eminent speakers speaking on this, uh, on very important topics in this symposium. The first talk will be by Dr. Mevan Vijaytunga. Dr. Mevan Vijaytunga is a cardiac electrophysiologist and he's joining us virtually today. Unfortunately, he is unable to come in person. He had been a regular a resource person for our annual sessions and, and also a, a regular teacher for our medical students and postgraduates. Uh, due to present situation, I, unfortunately, he cannot uh, be present in person today. However, uh, we are thankful to Mevan for joining us virtually. Good morning. I am Mevan Vijaytunga, cardiac electrophysiologist. I'll be talking today about catheter ablation in the management of cardiac arrhythmias. I'm thankful to the College of Physicians for giving me this opportunity. Before we talk about catheter ablation, I would like to point at a few basics. Cardiac rhythm disorders referred to rapid heart rates or slow heart rates. Tachyarrhythmias are defined as heart rates greater than 100 beats per minute, and bradyarrhythmias are defined as heart rates less than 50 beats per minute. Catheter ablation is usually used to treat or manage tachyarrhythmias. Now, when it comes to tachycardia, there are several classifications, and I would like to give you a more practical classification based upon anatomy. So we divide them initially into supraventricular or ventricular arrhythmia based upon the site of origin of the tachycardia. And supraventricular tachycardia thereafter can be subcategorized based on the mechanism like AVNRT, which stands for atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia, or AVRT, which stands for um, atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, or atrial tachycardia. And in this group, you can bundle together atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. A ventricular tachycardia can be subcategorized based upon the underlying substrate, whether it's ischemic or non-ischemic. And a patient with a tachycardia can present with multiple complaints. Now, some patients are asymptomatic, and, and the tachycardia is incidentally detected by a caregiver or a physician, or, or when they take pulse or take an ECG. The other patients may present with palpitations and that word palpitations can be described by the patient in different ways. Chest discomfort, shortness of breath or fatigue. Now fatigue, for example, could be a prominent symptom in atrial fibrillation whereas patient may or may not know that he or she has underlying arrhythmia. Now other presentations include anxiety, uh, near syncope or dizziness, loss of consciousness or syncope, seizures, or even death. Now, when someone tries to diagnose a tachyarrhythmia or manage tachyarrhythmia, uh, history and physical examination are important, but nothing matches an electrocardiogram. So ECG is the cornerstone in the management of tachycardia, but also to 
have an insight into the mechanism of tachycardia or at times to locate the tachycardia within the heart and ECG is very helpful. So going into some basic anatomy and physiology, the heart rhythm originates, as we all know, in the sinus node. And from sinus node, the impulse travels across the right atrium and left atrium and converges into the AV node. And once it gets to the AV node, it passes through the node to the bundle of his and then to the right and left bundle branches. And from there onwards, through the Purkinje fibers, it enters the muscle of the right or left ventricles. So that's the normal propagation of the cardiac impulse. Now, Cardiac arrhythmias, in physiologic terms, can occur due to uh, various mechanisms. Now, there are three main mechanisms, namely abnormal automaticity, triggered activity, and re-entry. So let me uh, go a little bit deeper into each of these mechanisms and, and by rekindling your uh, memory in physiology. Now, we all know the sinus node has the capacity to generate a cardiac impulse by itself, even without any external trigger. Now, the, to create an action potential like this, you need to reach a certain threshold level, which is here and there. Now, as, uh, cells in the sinus node gradually depolarized without any external stimuli. And once they reach this threshold level, it creates or generates the action potential. Now, other cells in the heart can acquire this ability to generate an impulse. So that's called abnormal automaticity. And that could be a mechanism behind certain arrhythmias. It could be atrial or ventricular. Now, from abnormal automaticity, let's uh, try to learn what the second mechanism, how does it occur, the triggered activity. So prior to that, let's think about how a normal heart cell depolarizes. The normal cardiac muscle depolarization um, has this shape of action potential. You have a rapid upshoot, which is what we call phase one. And then there is an initial attempt to repolarize, that's phase two, and then the phase three is plateau. And then you keep repolarizing through phase four back to, back to zero. Now that's the normal cardiac depolarization. Now, when the heart muscle is getting repolarized, that is during phase three or phase four, or even uh, early part of phase zero, you don't expect another action potential to occur, but there are certain times there can be small upshoots during um, phase three, phase four, and, 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 and or even early part of phase zero. And these things occur sometimes in even situations like um, polymorphic ventricular tachycardias or even during digoxin toxicity. And, and these action potentials are called um, after depolarizations. And cardiac arrhythmias generated by these after depolarizations uh, can be even lethal in certain circumstances. And that mechanism is called triggered activity. For example, if this small offshoot can reach a threshold level and create a new um, action potential, it could be a single beat or it could be multiple or repetitive heartbeats. Now, this mechanism, which means the, uh, the, the generation of an arrhythmia due to uh, after depolarizations, it's called triggered activity. Now, the abnormal automaticity could be coming from few cells and that can create a rapid rhythm, whether in the atrium or ventricle. Similarly, triggered activity can cause arrhythmias, mostly in the ventricle, but even maybe even in atrium. Now, they come from focal sources. So when an arrhythmia is generated from a focus, it spreads around. If it's atrium, 
it just keeps spreading around. Even in the ventricle, it spreads around. So similar to uh, raindrops falling on a, on a still water, it spreads around. So once the uh, impulse is generated in the atrium, it can technically spread through the bundle of his to the ventricle and the ventricle follows. So rapid atrial rhythms can cause rapid ventricular rates based on the conduction through the bundle of his. And similarly, if there's a ventricular arrhythmia, it can potentially conduct in the retrograde direction, that direction to the atrium and thereby increase the atrial rate. Now we know that uh, cardiac muscle can conduct electricity just like uh, copper or, or iron or aluminum wires can conduct electricity, but there's a difference. Copper wires can conduct electricity continuously without a break. Cardiac muscle on the other hand ha can conduct, but once it depolarizes, it has to repolarize before it can depolarize again. So with that in mind, let's think about how re-entry in the heart occurs. How does it occur? Now, here I'm going to illustrate this with this circuitry. This is a hypothetical circuit. Imagine there is an electrical impulse coming down and that's a depolarization wave and it can go either to the left or right. It has an equal opportunity and it depolarizes down to a common pathway like that. So this circuit, can happen just like this could be a sinus heartbeat keep coming down like this and it depolarizes and then once depolarization is over the tissue repolarizes and then accepts the next impulse now think so now let's think of a little bit of different scenario where there is a so-called a block in one of the two pathways so to the right here, there is a barrier so that if, if an electrical impulse comes in this direction, it gets it cannot go through this. It's, there's a conduction block here. But it also can, on the other hand, can conduct in the opposite direction. So this is a so-called a conduction block in, in one direction, but not in the other. It's called a unidirectional conduction block. So let's see what happens if an electrical impulse comes. It comes down as usual. It can go down toward the left, but not the right. But once it goes to the right, it can either go this direction or that direction, and it keeps going, and it can also turn around. So if you look at that, you see the impulse can go, to, it can turn around. And now, as mentioned earlier, this is a unidirectional conduction block, so it can go back up. Now. Once it goes back up, the tissue that is up here is has depolarized earlier and has already repolarized because it has been sort of a it has enough time to do that. So now this tissue up here can accept this upcoming impulse and get depolarized for a second time. So when that happens, um, electricity can now come down again. So this kind of a circuitry can, can re repeat multiple times. So for, and now here I try to illustrate that, that repetitive pattern due to unidirectional conduction block can occur like this. So this is so-called re-entry. It keeps going around. And to do that, you need to have a unidirectional conduction block. So having a re-entrant circuit is sort of like catching your own tail. And in this case, the circuit is going in the clockwise direction. Now, the same circuit can go in the opposite direction as well, in the counterclockwise direction. And this type of circuitry can occur in the atrium, ventricle, or between atrium and ventricle. So when somebody has a cardiac arrhythmia, what are the treatment options? Obviously, the patient education is imperative. 
particularly if you and the patient decide to just maintain watchful observation. And that could be a good strategy for some patients. Then we have an uh, option for lifestyle changes. Then medical therapy, which is often um, antiarrhythmic therapy. And then catheter ablation, which is the, the topic of my discussion. So before I talk a little bit more about catheter ablation, let's see how we got here. Not surprisingly, cardiothoracic surgeons pioneered the invasive management of cardiac arrhythmia. In 1968, they published that Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, which is shown in this ECG, you can probably appreciate there is this slurring of QRS complex, what we call delta wave. And this is a Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, very characteristic ECG. And patients with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome can develop uh, cardiac arrhythmias. And in this article in 1968, they showed that surgical interruption results in um, complete eradication of wolf parkinson white syndrome. Now, how did they do? They went into this region of the heart, what we call a atrioventricular groove. And of course, they had to map that area electrically with the help of physicians and then they surgically excised tissue and then resuture. By doing so, they proved that there was an accessory electrical connection that can be surgically interrupted. So with that in mind, surgical therapy of cardiac arrhythmia came into life. At the same time, so around time, there was a lot of enthusiasm to um, detect cardiac arrhythmias and describe the mechanisms behind these arrhythmias. In 1969, when the first man landed on moon, Neil Armstrong, Ben Sherlock, a scientist in Oklahoma, described what we call the first his electrogram. What did, he, what did he do? He introduced a catheter to the heart. So we know that sinus node AV node bundle of his and so on. He introduced a catheter to the heart and he recorded electrogram on the his bundle. And this was no small finding because once you recognize there is a his bundle electrogram you can utilize that to know which direction impulse is traveling. And that immensely helped the diagnosis or even explanations behind certain arrhythmias. So gradually the catheters were used as, diag you know, that, that catheters came into being as diagnostic tools. Now, this is a, again to illustrate that we all recognize the P wave and the QRS complex in a usual electrogram, PQRST. And inside the heart, if you put a catheter in the his bundle area, you can see that it falls right after the P wave because that's the atrial electro electrical activity. And this is the ventricular electrical activity, the QRS, and the his falls right in the middle because the electricity go from atrium to the ventricle in that direction. And that's the his. 1982 saw a giant leap in the management of cardiac arrhythmias. The researchers at the University of California, San Francisco introduced uh, what we call the catheter-based technique. They introduced a catheter through the femoral vein to the heart, and they delivered a high out voltage output to the bundle of his region. And then they proved that 
by delivering high voltage energy locally, you could block the conduction through that tissue. And in this particular patient, they had to block the conduction through the bundle of his, thereby they created complete atrioventricular block iatrogenically, which is a planned thing they did, because the patient had atrial fibrillation and rapid ventricular response, and that could not be managed with medications. So once this point was proven, which means catheter-based technique can be utilized for ablation, obviously there was a lot of enthusiasm, and this technique was refined over the years, and ultimately it supplanted entirely cardiothoracic surgical management of arrhythmias, almost entirely. So today we have specialized catheters that can be used for ablation. We use predominantly two forms of energy. Commonly we use radio frequency energy to heat up the tissue from a body temperature of 37 Celsius to about 50 Celsius and, and deliver that this energy through a catheter tip of about three to four millimeter size introduced through a usually transvenous route. We also use cryothermal energy, which means we use liquid nitrogen introduced through a catheter tip to freeze down the tissue to about minus 70 Celsius and in either situation, you try to target a culprit tissue that is responsible for an arrhythmia. And by doing so, you block the conduction through that and thereby um, either prevent or at least reduce the burden of arrhythmia. Now, this is an example where you can see uh, an ablation catheter here, here. It's being used to block this electrical circuit that goes around like this. And once the ablation is done, there's a line of block here. So electricity now cannot go beyond that block. So the circuit is broken. It cannot continue. So let me give you a brief example of uh, catheter ablation of an arrhythmia. Now, this is a patient with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Uh, you can appreciate the delta wave, uh, which is quite prominent in pretty much every lead. This patient has Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, which means the patient has an accessory electrical conduction tissue. And because of this accessory conduction tissue, the patient develops or is prone to develop certain arrhythmias. Now, this is how uh, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome patients can get certain type of arrhythmias, and they have uh, this extra electrical connection beside the bundle of his here. So, electrical impulse can go down the bundle of his, and then it can find its way back up through this extra electrical connection and create this re entrance circuit. So, with the catheter ablation, we try to localize this extra electrical connection or what we call accessory pathway or bypass track. Bypass means it's bypassing the bundle of his. So once we localize that bypass track, we can put a catheter to that spot and uh, we can either cauterize or use radio frequency energy or we can use cryothermal energy to ablate it. And that's very successful in preventing conduction through that accessory pathway. And this is what we see in the electrophysiology laboratory when we are ablating Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. To the left of the ECG here, you can see the patient has the classical Wolf-Parkinson-White ECG pattern, a delta wave or, uh, or ventricular pre-excitation pattern. And as we keep applying radio frequency energy on the accessory pathway between beat number four and beat number five, you can see this delta wave that is here suddenly disappears. That means there is no longer conduction through that accessory pathway that was successfully ablated. So today we use catheter ablation to successfully treat many types of arrhythmias. For supraventricular arrhythmias, or supraventricular tachycardia, 
Catheterization is successful 90 to 95% in preventing recurrences, so as good as achieving a cure. For ventricular tachycardia, the success rate can be 70 to 90%. Now, ventricular tachycardia is a very heterogeneous group. I just bundled them together. Some type of ventricular tachycardia are less successful, but at least in those cases, we may not eliminate the problem, but we can, we can reduce today the, the burden of ventricular tachycardia. Atrial fibrillation, again, it's a heterogeneous group. The success rate of atrial fibrillation can be, in certain cases, like about 50%, or it can be up to 80%. Now, AV nodal ablation, in which we target the bundle of his region, is almost always successful, 99% with one procedure. The other, the flip side of the coin is that the catheter ablation can also be performed with relatively low risk. With time, the technology has improved to the level that, uh, of course, it depends on the patient, depends on the procedure. Uh, there are many risk factors, but common uh, risks of the procedure include, obviously, not always uh, one can get every arrhythmia under control, so there may be a need for a redo procedure. But the bleeding, like a major bleed that needs blood transfusions, is very rare. Deep pain thrombosis is rare. Some type, sometime you might end up needing a permanent pacemaker after the ablation. That's also a very rare finding, and it depends on the tachycardia. Death from uh, uh, the catheter ablation is, is an extremely rare thing. So the risks benefits obviously need to be discussed, but it's favorable in terms of procedure as opposed to not performing. Obviously, it depends on the individual patient. Today, we have enhanced technology to visualize these arrhythmias uh, with a certain mapping technique. And this is a situation where you can see uh, atrial flutter uh, going in a, in a circular manner around the tricuspid annulus. Now, the future is also exciting. Uh, even already, uh, uh, the holographic imaging, the 3D visualization is, is being introduced. So in summary, um, this is what I have to say. Compared to the medical therapy, catheter ablation has a very high success rate in controlling the arrhythmias. Some arrhythmias, I carefully use the word, can be cured by catheter ablation. In other clinical circumstances, catheter ablation is quite useful in reducing the cardiac arrhythmia burden. And, and last but not least, one has to describe the pros and cons of this approach, but catheter ablation today provides one of the few times we can cure certain cardiac arrhythmias. With, with that, thank you for your attention. I wish you all safe times during this pandemic. If you have any questions, uh, I will be available. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mewan, uh, for that uh, comprehensive uh, talk on uh, cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, we'll see whether there are any questions. In the absence of uh, questions, we will move on to the next topic. Uh, the speaker is uh, Dr. Neo Malia Marasena, who is no stranger to us, one of our past presidents and a senior cardiologist. Uh, she will talk on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, challenges, and future opportunities. Over to you, Madam. Sorry, forgot about the mask. I'd like to thank the Ceylon College of Physicians for having invited me to give this talk on heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, current challenges and future opportunities. 
Now, heart failure, as you know, is a leading and increasing cause of morbidity and mortality. And over the last 20 years, a great emphasis was pla placed on mainly improving survival and quality of life. However, in spite of the large number of drugs which have been introduced, the mortality rema rates remain unacceptably high. As you can see with this uh, chart, which shows the survival of people by the decade. And even in 2009, it was only 60%. So the different categories of heart failure is HEFPEF, where the ejection fraction is more than 50%, HEFMREF, which is the middle child, and the, the ejection fraction between 40 to 49%. And the topic we are interested in today is the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And it's defined as a heart failure where the ejection fraction is less than 40%. So where are we now? So let's consider different aspects. One is the outcomes as well as the medical treatment. And you can see that over the years, the large number, we have got a large uh, number of drugs as well as devices and various other methods of managing heart failure compared to the digoxin diuretics and vasodilators which were available in 1989. Diuretics were essentially to relieve congestion However, the neurohormonal antagonists modify the disease course, they reduce the heart, uh, the hospitalization heart, uh, this, uh, due to heart failure, and they improve mortality. And these are the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, and mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, which had been there for a long time. And then the real game changer, that is ARNI, or angiotensin receptor antagonist neutralizing inhibitor. And these are the pillars of therapy. And in the, according to the ESC guidelines of 2016, a patient with symptomatic HFREF, you start treating with an ACE inhibitor and beta blocker if there are no contraindications. If there is a, if they can't tolerate the ACE inhibitor, only would you start an ARB. And if they're still symptomatic with an EF of less than 35%, you can add on the MRA. And still symptomatic, you can, if they're able to tolerate the ACE and ARB, you add on ARNI. Though now you can actually add on ARNI if you start, you can even start with ARNI, but still because of the cost, people are not uh, a bit reluctant to start it. Then if they're tachycardic, if they're at the heart rate of more than 70, ivibradine, and uh, with the wide QRS complex, you can uh, do a cardiac resynchronizing therapy, resynchronization therapy or CRT, where the QRS complex is more than 130 milliseconds. Now, if all those don't seem to work and they're very resistant, you can try some of the old stuff, that is the digoxin, the isosorbide dinitrate hydrazine combinations, or you can get on to LVADs, which we don't have here as yet, and finally, heart transplantation. So the pharmacological treatment has become more complex as new agents are developed. So the issues are what drugs should be used in what sequence? It should be linear or more horizontal algorithm. You also have a problem regarding the spending function. In other words, just like if you have a certain amount of money, you can't buy, say, the more expensive uh, furniture, but you might have to just settle for something in plastic. So just like that, the drug therapy affects each clinical parameters, which I mentioned here, that is the pressure, heart rate, EGFR, and potassium. And these determine how far you can go with your, blood, with your drug doses to achieve what really should be, what is really recommended in that, in what you call guideline-directed medical therapy. So your foundational therapy now is ARNI, which also you have to add on ACE inhibitors and ARBs, MRA, and beta blockers. And uh, the neurohumoral mod modification, as you can see, is ACE, ARB, MRA, ARNI for the renal, renin angiotensin aldosterone axis. The sympathetic nervous system inhibited by the beta blockers and ARNI acting on the nephrolyzing, which is a nephrolyzing inhibitor. Now, nephrolyzing, why, why should it sort of combine it with uh, the ARB? Nephrolyzing inhibition alone is ineffective because there's angiotensin potentiation. And uh, where ideally it should be combined with an ACE inhibitor because of the potential sort of dangers due to possible angioedema it is combined with the angiotensin receptor blocker. 
And the paradigm heart failure trial, which was a real mm -hmm. game changer, showed that when you are giving the uptight rate of the sacrobutyl vasartan to 200 milligrams twice a day compared to the ideal enalapril dose for heart failure, which is 10 milligrams BD, and you can see a significant, I mean, there are six zeros in this p-value, reduction of the primary endpoint, which is cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization, and even the secondary endpoints were very, very significant. And you can see that sacrobutyl vasartan doubles the survival benefit of current renin angiotensin inhibitors. And so what registry evidence have we got? If we go back to the, go with the guidelines heart failure registry, where 40,000 patients were evaluated in between 2005 and 2009, and about roughly the same number had HFPEF and HFREF. The overall median survival was dismal. So it's just 2.1 years with a five-year mortality rate of 75% and with a very high hospital readmission rate for HFREF. So where are we now? What about adherence to therapy? Now you can see that actually, if you look at the, this is in 2013, the ESC heart failure long-term registry, quite a significant number got the IS inhibitor beta blocker and a reasonable number got the MRA. However, in adjusted models, older age, lower blood pressure, more severe functional class, renal insufficiency, and recent heart failure hospitalization generally favored low medication utilization and dose. And you can see how there's a very small percentage got ANI and also a relatively small percentage got their MRAs. This again shows something similar where only where, where they got optimal doses only 22% got the S inhibitor and 12% got optimal doses of beta blockers according to the current guidelines. And when they titrated the guideline decided uh, this guideline determined medical therapy in HFREF, again, you can see the green is where the optimum doses are and how small the green, green areas are. And the Biostat CHF showed the adjusted mortality rate and if you look at the two lower lines, I mean, those are the ones who had got 50 to 100% of the required dose and the mortality is significantly lower than the one to 50%. So why the poor adherence? If you look at ARB, beta blockers and MRA, in ARB, the main reasons for non-use of recommended drug therapy was worsening renal function and particularly symptomatic hypotension. Beta blockers, symptomatic hypotension. Also, you had bronchospasm and bradyarrhythmias, as well as worsening heart failure. MRAs, there was hyperkalemia and worsening renal functions. So, if you look at this, I mean, there's evidence based therapy, but because of poor tolerance due to hypotension, renal dysfunction, and underdosing, it, leads, it led to underdosing with withdrawal medical therapy, poor outcomes of HFREF, and back again. So the challenges of HFREF treatment is we have multiple guidelines and clinical practice updates, international ones, the ESE, ACC, AHA, and regional and local guidelines. But the morbidity and mortality remains high. And large percentage of patients do not receive guideline-directed medical therapy. There are also other types of treatment, as you know, ivabradine, digoxin, hydralazine, isotol, by dinitrate, device therapy, also management of comorbidities like hyperkalemia, iron deficiency and hyperlipidemia. And the heart rate plays a pivotal role in cardiovascular disease. For instance, atherosclerosis leads to ischemia, remodeling and chronic heart failure. And the elevated heart rate makes matters worse where you have an increased endothelial dysfunction and oxidative stress, increased oxygen consumption and uh, increased oxygen demand with reduced ventricular efficiency. And the limitations of beta blockers is that patients with chronic heart failure who are on beta blockers have inadequately controlled heart rate. Basically, they do not tolerate the target doses of beta blockers used in the large clinical trials. Probably can remember the Merit HF where they're using about 250 milligrams of metoprolol. The SHIFT trial showed the importance of ivabradin in heart failure where because, because of tachycardia, the patients did not do well. And by reducing the heart rate, because it acts on heart rate alone, there was a significant improvement. 
and uh, therefore both in the 2016 ACC guidelines and the 2012 European guidelines, they are the class 2A indication. IB iron nozzle has come to the forefront. And uh, in fact, I'll get on to the, the study presented just only last week at the American Heart Association, the firm AHF, where they compared IV ferric carboxymaltase on hospitalization and mortality in iron deficient subjects admitted for acute heart failure. Not necessarily anemia, it's iron deficient. And uh, they considered those with a serum ferritin of less than 100 nanograms and uh, serum ferritin of 100 to 300 should have a transfer in saturation of less than 20%. And there was uh, an increase or uh, the primary endpoint was more in the placebo group. As you can see, the p-value is about 0 0.059, but it was, uh, it's recommended that in this category that we could, you could actually use IV iron. So the challenges and limitations of the current HFREF Therapy. The summary is that heart failure with reduced ejection fraction are at high risk for adverse EV events. Optimizing treatment is a key therapeutic goal. And there's an unmet need for disease modifying therapies which have an immediate impact on patient well being and are well tolerated. So there's room for improvement. So we come to the new drugs with new mechanisms of action the SGLT2 inhibitors, the soluble guanylate cyclase stimulators, and the cardiac myosin. In activators. So the ones which were initially considered were dapagliflozin, though now empagliflozin has also come in, and verisiguat, omecamtiv, and mecabil. So let's get on to, these are the, this is the timeline of all these trials. You can see all those, those uh, uh, magenta ones are the ones where they used uh, mechanical devices. And uh, we were sort of eagerly awaiting the last trials, which was with the empagliflozin as well as the myosin activator. So the SGLT2 inhibitors are, have been now well proven to be beneficial in the treatment of heart failure because diabetes is an independent risk factor. And several large cardiovascular outcome trials demonstrated a reduction in cardiovascular outcomes in patients treated with SGLT2 inhibitors, whether they had atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or not, and whether they had a history of heart failure or not. So the dapa HF trial with 10 milligrams of uh, dapagliflozin showed a significant reduction of the composite CV death, heart failure hospitalization, and urgent heart failure visit, p-value being less than 001. And what was more interesting was the diabetic status. If you looked at the, the broken lines, those are the patients with no diabetes. And there again, you can see that there is a significant reduction in uh, the primary endpoints with the dapagliflozin group compared to placebo. So and there's an early separation of the kaplan meier curves for the primary endpoint. So the benefits are the, in the early course of the heart failure. It's favorable effects on symptoms, function, and quality of life in patients with HFREF. And the beneficial effects were observed, uh, observed in patients with prediabetes on omoglycemia and were independent of HbA1c level at baseline. The emperor reduced trial, which was with empagliflozin, again, was statistically significant when it came to the reduced, when it came to the time to cardiovascular death or hospitalization heart failure, which was the primary endpoint. However, in DAPA-HF, there appeared to be a significant reduction in cardiovascular mortality, which was not observed with empagliflozin, but however, that could be the way the trial was designed. They also, again, this was presented last week at the American Heart Association, the impact of empagliflozin on the health status outcomes as measured by the Kansas City Questionnaire. The baseline health status did not influence the empagliflozin benefit on the primary end or secondary endpoints. And the benefits were similar across all the different tertials of the KCCQ. And there was less deterioration and more improvement in KCCQ CCS for empagliflozin over time. So the next drug is the soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator. The nitric oxide CGMP pathway is a key regulator of vascular tone 
and smooth muscle cell function, which also regulates tissue remodeling, fibrosis, inflammation, and proliferation. Also, reduced levels of nitric oxide are associated with heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. So the Victoria trial was really to show whether the reverisiguat would be superior to placebo when added to standard therapy. And they selected people with EF of less than 45% and a high BNP and with blood pressures of less than 100. Well, there was an improvement. However, it did not, uh, the p-values were like 0 0.02. This probably could be the reason because if you looked at the BNPs, the, in the first three quartiles, there was an improvement of verisiguat over placebo, but where the BNP was more than 5,000, it seemed to be the reverse was there. So those are the really bad ones. So when you looked at these two emerging HFREF therapies, dapagliflozin is well tolerated, easy to use, and likely to be recommended for use in a broad range of patients with HFREF. And there's strong evidence base from the DAPA-HF trial. While in Verisiguat, the efficacy and safety was demonstrated in the Victoria trial, but the recommendations would more likely to be limited compared to dapagliflozin. Also, DAPA is currently available for the treatment of hyperglycemia in diabetes, so should be given strong consideration as an antihyperglycemic agent in patients with diabetes and HFREF. While verisquat is likely a secondary versus more than a first-line treatment, very high-risk patients may find benefit. Another treatment option is there in a HFREF armamentarium. Now this is, now we get on to the systole, reduced systolic function where we are getting to, to real basics. We'll, well, let's talk about inotropes. Now we are quite used to the inotropes which change the cardiac myocyte calcium balance. But essentially those inotropes were like, using them was like beating a dead horse. So now there's a new framework where they're categorized into calcitropes, mitotropes, and myotropes. And the calcitropes are what we are used to, the dopamines, the dobutamines, epinephrines, even the cardiac glycosides, where they alter intracellular calcium concentrations, can improve the heart failure symptoms, but, and may have a role in acute shock and uh, for palliation. However, long-term use with an is associated with an increased mortality in patients with HFREF. The mitotropes like trimetazidine alter the mitochondrial energy production However, not enough studies have been done. They're just small cohorts and open label studies. So large RCTs are required. Now the point of interest, omicamte macabil, targets the myosin acting, basically the structural elements of the sarcomere via calcium independent mechanisms. It was in the late stages of clinical development and the phase three studies was presented just last week. So contractility, which is a forced generation, increases stroke volume and cardiac output. And these are all influenced by afterload, preload, heart rate, and valvular competence. So the mechanism of uh, omicamtiv vocabulary is that it's a selective cardiac myosin activator, which binds to the myosin motor domain. And it uh, acts as a pre-power stroke state prior to the onset of the cardiac contraction and increases the number of force generators. So the, what it does is it force production is increased, the systolic ejection time is increased, and the stroke volume is increased. It does not affect the myocyte calcium concentration or oxygen uptake or heart, rate, heart rate. Now, if you look at this, you can see that there is, uh, at the start, there is the myosin exists in a kind of equilibrium. Then there is, it joins up with the actin. Now, it's at that point during systole that, it, uh, that the omicamte macabre acts, the pre-power stroke. And then what it does, it, it increases the number of myosin heads, which joins up to the actin, and it increases the power stroke, uh, producing more force during each cardiac contraction, a bit like this, where more hands or myosin heads grasp the rope and pull, leading to more force, force produced. Uh, there were several studies. This was the base, the first one, the atomic AHF, which was a phase two study where they really used heart failure patients who were in hospital ones. And uh, there wasn't that much benefit in, except it improved dyspnea in one of, the, one of the cohorts. 
The Cosmic Ketchup, which is the phase 2B trial, was a much better designed one, and where they used uh, titrated, they titrated the doses, and uh, you got an increase in the systolic ejection time, stroke volume, reduction in the left ventricle and systolic diameter, and in diastolic diameter, it reduced the heart rate and the nt pro bmp concentration. The effects were independent of ischemic versus non-ischemic heart failure etiology or even the presence of atrial fibrillation. And the similar effects of formicamptin was there, whether it was in week 12 or week 20. And there was, a, as you can see, the progressive decreases of nt pro and pro bmp over time. So the galactic heart failure study was meant to basically prove all this. It was again presented last week at the AHA and uh, where they started with the lower star starting dose and increased it. And uh, this was the, if you looked at the, the kind of patients, they had EF of about 27%. They were well treated with the, all the other drugs. You can see very high percentages of ASA, ARB and ANI, beta blockers and mineral corticoid antagonists, even the SGLT2 inhibitors. So the primary outcome was that where there was an improvement with the omicron trimacabe, but the p-value was about 0.03. Probably because they really got the proper drugs at the proper doses, because ARNI is a real game changer. So to summarize the galactic trial, it was the first in class myosin activator developed for the treatment of patients with HFREF. And the primary endpoint was uh, this was p, but a p value of about 0 0.03. No benefit in outcomes of CV deaths, uh, cause death, or in the cases of acute total symptom score. But however, there was possibly a greater treat treatment effect among those with an ejection fraction of less than 28%. So now you have two more which has joined this uh, timeline that is the Galactic HF as well as the Emperor Reduced. So, what's the future? If you take the HFREF triple therapy, which includes the ARN, includes ARNI, cardiac myosin activators reduce the heart failure hospitalizations with the EF of less than 28%. SGLT2 inhibitors reduces mortality and heart failure hospitalizations very, very clearly. The soluble gonadate cyclist stimulators like Verisigoat reduces the heart failure hospitalization. And it can be a four-way street, street where you add on the neurohormonal antagonists as well. So to conclude, we'll get back to what was the problem originally, that was kidney dysfunction and hypotension. So if you take the neurohormone antagonists with kidney dysfunction, they, although they're potentially beneficial, but they're contraindicated in many cases where there's an increase in your creatinine. Often not tolerated when the blood pressure is low and there's no data with the blood pressure of less than 95, even in the Paradigm HF study. The SGLT2 inhibitors, yes, but no data with the EGFR of less than 30. Or with and all the studies, the blood pressure was more than 95, but they do not cause hypotension. The inverisquat or the soluble gonadate cyclase stimulator, the data was with EJFR of more than 15 and the blood pressure of more than 100. The my myosin activators again has no effect on the blood pressure of the GFR, so they use GFR of over 20 and blood pressure of more than over 85 because hypotension was not accept, expected. So you can sort of juggle around with these and add on some of the newer ones where you cannot step up the older ones, even however well proven they are. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, madam. Uh, is there any questions? We can entertain a couple of questions. Are there any? Uh, in the meantime, uh, can I ask my co-chair, Dr. Sanjeev Vijay Sikhon, uh, to uh, give a token of appreciation to Dr. Neolamuri Amarsena. As a question, Madam, uh, one is, do we have ARNI available in hospitals? That's one thing. Mm. Uh, the second question is, is there a place for SLG2 inhibitors 
in uh, FREF without diabetes? Yes, I think with the SGLT2, well, let's start with the second one. The SGLT2 inhibitors clearly showed that when you do not have diabetes, that there is a def definite benefit. And I think I showed it in one of the slides. So you can give it, and also you actually don't have too much of a problem because the hype, the, you know, the, one of the biggest problems with the SGLT2 inhibitors is the sugar which passes in the urine, the glycosuria. And that is much less in the non-diabetics. In fact, I don't think you hardly get it. So the chances of having balanitis and uh, you know, these various fungal infections is probably less in that category than in the diabetic category. And as for the availability of uh, Mahani in this country, not officially. Um, <laughs> that is, uh, that it's, it's still not been registered. But there are always ways and means of getting these things. One question from me, Madam, uh, it's, uh, although not directly related to the topic, what is the place of BNP on deciding medical management? Because uh, most of the new trials have included BNP as the inclusion criteria. Because BNP is very necessary. I mean, it causes natriuresis. And uh, so the thing is, but it's because the nepralizing really, uh, is, uh, it breaks it down that you needed the nepralizing inhibitor. And it is actually quite useful in monitoring patients. Our biggest problem is really cost. If you're even in the hospital, I mean, you know, you can't keep ordering BNP in a kind of, uh, you know, serial way. But it gives you one thing, it helps you to differentiate from respiratory problems, because sometimes you can really get mixed up, you know, the cardiac asthma and the, the respiratory asthma, as well as, uh, you know, similar diseases, you can differentiate the cardiac from the respiratory, but quite apart from that, you can see the progress. And uh, it is, I, I find it quite useful to do serial BNPs whenever possible. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, in view of the time factor, we will stop here. And uh, once again, uh, on behalf of Ceylon College of Physicians, I thank uh, Dr. Amalia Matsena for this excellent talk. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Ruan Nekanayaka. Uh, uh, everybody knows him. He doesn't need any introduction. He's a senior uh, cardiologist and also a very much acknowledged teacher. And also, I must say, I had the privilege of doing my post intern appointment under, him, under his supervision. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Chair Persons, and I may thank the Ceylon College of Physicians for inviting me to give this lecture. Now, I have been asked to speak on the new concepts in preventive cardiology. So I will start with the old material first. We have the traditional risk factors, the hyperlipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, obesity, lack of exercise, and mental stress, which are the modifiable risk factors, and the male gender and the genetic predisposition, which are the non-modifiable risk factors. Now, in addition to this list of risk factors, we have now added a whole host of risk factors for ischemic heart disease. Starting from homocystinemia from the Framingham study, the hard water, the novel lipid molecules of live protein, small a, and the trans fats, the pro-inflammatory state, sleep disorders, air pollution, noise pollution, social insecurity, social economic disadvantage, preterm genetic pre-programming, extremes of temperature, gut microbiome, the premenopause, and eclampsia. Now, I will not be discussing all, this, all these topics in this lecture, not possible in 25 minutes. But I would like to concentrate on certain aspects of this, maybe four or five of these. And I shall be basing my presentation on the uh, ACCHA guidelines of last year. Now, prevention of ischemic heart disease starts from the womb and must proceed to the tomb because cardiovascular disease is a dynamic process. Hence, its prevention also must be continuous. You can't stop at any age. Now, starting from the womb, mechanisms linking preterm birth to the onset of cardiovascular disease later in adulthood has become a current topic. Why is this so? We said ischemic heart disease is genetic, but today we know that genetics is not the only thing that works there. It is the epigenetics. And the epigenetics is modified by the time spent in the womb and the pathophysiological processes initiated thereof. 
Now, cardiovascular disease rates in adulthood are high in premature infants, and studies show intense oxygen stress and inflammation at tissue levels. Now, I must tell you that during this lecture, I will not be presenting epidemiological or field study data. So many percentage had this percentage, etc. No, that I will not be doing. We will be concentrating on the new concepts in prevention, trying to understand the pathophysiology of disease. Now, in preterm infants, we have intense oxygen stress and inflammation at tissue levels. Later on, lipid profile, fetal epidermics, and the gut microbiota in these infants are changed, and this becomes important later on. Now, potential mechanisms linking preterm birth to cardiovascular disease is threefold. The intracellular oxidative stress, diminished nitric oxide generation, which is the ENOS, which is the one that causes endothelial uh, functionality, and endothelial dysfunction secondary to nitric oxide degeneration. Now, from the onset of atherosclerosis, which is asymptomatic, to the culmination in a clinically relevant event, the state of oxidative stress is encountered, leading to excess generation of reactive oxygen species. This becomes very, very important, the reactive oxygen species. Now, the reactive, I'm going rapidly. The reactive oxygen species is important because it affects the nitrogen nitric oxide synthetase, the ENOS, the endothelial nitric oxide synthetase, reducing the nitric oxide synthetase uh, activity. And it also indirectly has an effect on what is called the oxidized LDL. Now, both of these affect endothelial dysfunction. And why is endothelial dysfunction important? Endothelial dysfunction is important because just because you have diabetes or just because you have uh, hyperlipidemia, these molecules don't go and affect the endothelium causing atherosclerosis. There must be endothelial dysfunction as a background strata for the hyperlipidemia or the oxidized LDL to go and damage the endothelium. The healthy endothelium is able to resist diabetic pathophysiological molecules as well as hyperlipidemic pathophysiological molecules. That is why this becomes so important. In preterm infants, the balance between production and elimination of the reactive oxygen species is deranged, and therefore there is enhanced production of the ROS during the prenatal and postnatal period, which leads to endothelial dysfunction. Now, in addition to the reactive oxygen species, we have also an important pathophysiological process going on, which is inflammation. Now, preterm neonates often present with an immature immune system manifested as impaired production of certain cytokines and enhanced production of certain cytokines because some cytokines are pro-inflammatory, some cytokines are anti-inflammatory, and the balance in the preterm infant is towards the pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now, if you take this diagram, you have the oxidative stress and you have the immune immune system in the uh, preterm infant, or even if you are not preterm, if there has been malnutrition inside the womb in the last trimester and in the first year of life, which is Barker's hypothesis, you have the LDL, which gets oxidized, and that goes through the endothelium into the cell. Followed by the macrophages, the ROS and the angiotensin 2 are secreted, which causes long-term effects uh, in which the smooth muscle cells proliferate, causing an atherosclerotic plaque. The endothelium is dysfunctional, and the pro-inflammation cytokines also act on the endothelium, giving rise to the atherosclerotic plaque. Not only if the atherosclerotic plaque is initiated by these immune mechanisms and the inflammatory mechanisms, but the instability of the plaque is also caused by these two mechanisms. And then Barker's hypothesis that malnutrition, the last line in this slide, the malnutrition in the last trimester and the first year of life leads to fetal programming, genetic programming, which leads to the activation of the thrifty gene leading to hypertension, ischemic heart disease, diabetes mellitus, glucose intolerance, etc. in later life. Now, preterm infants who reach childhood often suffer from adverse cardiac remodeling, including dilatation of the ventricles. But very importantly, lower stroke volume 
with compensatory increase in the heart rate. You find children and also young adults with an underlying tachycardia, which we at one time we said this is a hyper beta state, and that is why they have the tachycardia. But now we know that it is genetically programmed, and these children are um, modified, have a modified pathophysiological basis for having this tachycardia. Now, in addition to the immune system and addition to the inflammation, we also have a problem in the atherosclerosis with the microbiome. The microorganisms present in the gut play a crucial role in absorbing and digesting nutrients from the food and are indispensable for maturation of a healthy immune system. The gut microbiome develops after birth through a haphazard progress stabilizing after a few weeks, maturing into adult-like microbiome during infancy. And of course, our antibiotics come and mess up the whole thing. The gut microbiome of neonates is affected by the mode of delivery. For instance, cesarean section results in a gut microbiome containing more skin type of microorganisms than vaginal delivery. And in formula fed infants, the microbiome changes and this may not be healthy. We have a lot of evidence from the types of bacteria found in the gut to commensal bacteria rather found in the gut to pathophysiological states of heart failure, ischemic heart disease and dilated cardiomyopathy, but the data is still in a state of flux. Now, we come to a new uh, co compound, the TMAO, the trimethylamine oxide, which is very important. And clinicians here will know that we have an acute coronary syndrome where you do troponins and the troponins are negative. The troponin negative acute coronary syndrome. And now we know that the TMAO derivatives are found as a marker in this subset of acute coronary syndromes where the troponins are negative repeatedly. We all come across this situation. Now, why, why are we saying this? Now, when you have a dietary intake of choline and carnitine, goes into the stomach and obviously goes into the gut. Now in the gut, the microbiome, which we have mentioned all the organisms there, metabolize the carnitine and the choline into TMA, the trimethylamine, which goes into the liver and is produced, converted by the uh, flavine uh, oxygenase, uh, oxygenase into TMAO. Now this TMAO is toxic. It causes cardiac remodeling, it enhances cardiac thrombosis and it causes accelerated atherosclerosis. Another force of accelerated atherosclerosis other than diabetes is the TMAO. That is why some people develop atherosclerosis at a rate and all this causes an increased rate. So remember this compound and the series, you will be hearing of uh, this in the next few years, I think a lot more. Now we come to food. Now you will wonder why I'm jumping to food. I will tell you. Now, the common advice regarding food do not always produce good results. Even pure vegetarians develop extensive atherosclerosis. The non-obese thin individuals also suffer massive heart attacks. They should not be having any atherosclerosis. They have lots of atherosclerosis. Seaside communities which are told to eat a lot of fish, dense diets, may have extensive ischemia. So the traditional risk factors that we are describing and the advice based on this do not always have the beneficial effects anticipated. Now we understand this now because of the immune system, the microbiome, and also the altered uh, pathophysiological status that we described initially in the preterm infants as being processed into the adults. And this becomes important in what has been now termed the functional food compounds in cardioprotection, action through the epigenome. Now, this is not genetics. This is genetics, part of genetics, but not the genes itself. It is the epigenetics, which I'm sure most of the physicians will know that most of our pathophysiological processes are now epigenetic and not purely genetic. Now, the human epigenome is being linked to CVD. I will put up a diagram. And we are talking of the omics. The methylome, the acetylome, and the NC, the non-coding RNA move. So you have all heard of this term, the omics, which is now coming into biological uh, uh, parlance, especially in medicine. 
And in the preventive cardiology, we are think, uh, uh, talking of three omics. The methylome, the acetylome, and the NCRNOME. Now, what are these? Now, these are <coughs> the epigenetic processes by which gene expression is modified. Now, if you look at this diagram, the top one, you will see certain foodstuffs. Folic acid, B1, alpha-glutarate, fumarate, succinates. Huh? You find the curcumin, uh, genistein, and you will be wondering what on earth these are. Beta-glucans, genistein, curcumin, resveratrol, downwards, poo fast the resveratrols. These are all substances found in foods. For example, resveratrol, you find in purple grapes and in red wine. You find curcumin, maybe in turmeric, the kaha that everybody is talking about these days. Now, long time we have been speaking that these various minor foodstuffs are beneficial for ischemic heart disease and the prevention of atherosclerosis. We did not know why, because we were always concentrating on lipids. We were always concentrating on sugar. Now, sugar also we know is not directly important because the HbA1c has no relationship which can be demonstrable with uh, atherosclerotic process. And when the empagliposin, depagliposin, etc., we normally were talking about, came into play, we knew that HbA1c is not only a very poor surrogate of atherosclerosis. Now, this omics is important because of the atherosclerotic processes are modified by these ohms, the methylome, the acetylome, and the enantheme. The BNO, I can give you the details of the epigenome, but I have no time to be doing that. So I will skip this. And we have a way of feeding the methylome. We have ways of feeding the acetylome. And we have methods of feeding the non-coding RNA. Now, this feeding becomes important with bioactive foods, because by this, we can reduce the atherosclerotic burden. Now, look at this diagram which are taken from the European Society of Cardiology. We have the Mediterranean diet on one side and the vegetarian diet on the other side. Now, why is the Mediterranean diet helpful? Or oh, everybody said it is due to the olive oil. But then they, the subsequent research by Mosafarian showed even virgin olive oil does not seem to be giving the benefit. Then they says it is not the monounsaturated fatty acid, it is the oleocanthal in the olive oil. And that is how these bioactive foods came through. So if we want to feed the acetylome and we want to feed the uh, NCRNOME, look at the, side, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the compounds that we have to consider, which I mentioned initially in my uh, cartoon, genistein found in soya and phytoestrians, curcumin found in turmeric, the epigalatectin and the galactectin found in the polyphenols found in tea and coffee, especially in green tea. The beta glucans in soluble fiber, cereal, grains, oats, and barley. The sulforaphanes, broccoli, cabbage, and kale. Queratin, the plant flavonols. These are the colors and the smells, smelly compounds in plants and uh, fruits, fruits and red onions. The fiston, the plant polyphenols, strawberries, onions, apples. Choline, eggs, poultry, fish, nicotine riboside in the alternate forms of vitamin D3, MIA RNA effects in almonds and poo for each nuts, and resveratrol, which I mentioned in purple grapes. Now, while we are mentioning all these compounds, will have some aspect important in atherosclerotic processes because of the action on feeding the methylome, feeding the acetylome, and feeding the NCRNO. Now, what about meats? We have the red meats, we have the white meats in poultry, and we have the non beet protein. These affect the TMAO differently. Now, carnitine and choline, I said before, forms the TMAO. Let us go fast. Now, chronic red dietary red meat increases the TMAO levels. That is why red meat, even if it is sometimes taken as what is called lean beef or lean cuts, of the red meat can be atherogenic because it enhances the TMAO levels and that becomes important. Here is the cartoon. You eat whatever that you are eating, the red meat, pork chops, etc., etc., and it goes into the tummy. Then your gut microbiota starts acting on it. The TMA is formed, goes into the liver, 
the TMA MAO is formed and the cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, thrombosis, CKD, heart failure, all are accelerated due to the TMAO. Important. Therefore, that the red meats are discouraged and the white meats are encouraged and this is the mechanism of action. Now, why I'm saying all this is my lecture is on new concepts. Now, I don't want to just give advice. I want to give you the scientific background on which the, we build up the preventive thing. Now, phosphatidylcholine, that this is found in the egg yolk. Now, you will remember that there were two conflicting studies on eggs published two years ago. One came from China, which said, if you eat seven and a half eggs per week, your atherosclerosis is less. Two weeks later, the New England Journal of Medicine published, uh, or JAMA was it, I can't remember, published an article saying more than two eggs per week, atherosclerotic risk and hyperlipidemia seems to be increased. Now we wondered how could two trials give such diverse opinions? It is because the study population probably had a different microbiota. If you have a microbiome which is pathological or non-physiological, the more eggs you eat of the phosphatidylcholine that you get, the production of TMAO is increased. If you have a very healthy microbiome, even if you eat a lot of eggs, the TMAO production is not enhanced. This is why the two trials were at loggerheads. So the plant-based and the Mediterranean diets, along with increased fruit, nuts, vegetables, legumes, vegetables, and animal protein consumption with inherent soluble and insoluble vegetable fiber have consistently been associated with a lower risk of all-cause mortality than control of standard diets. Now I have only five minutes left and I have only spoken on food. So I will not, I will skip all my other slides uh, and skip all this. Perhaps I will take sleep for one minute and then go on to my last set, a set of slides. How much should we sleep? Now, why is this? Because now the sleep studies are indicating to us that we are changing the diurnal variation or the secretion of hormones. We are changing the diurnal variation or the secretion of hormones by the abnormal sleep patterns. Therefore, we have sleep during the night and we have a concept called the daytime napping. Now, just to summarize, the ideal number of sleep, which is good for cardiovascular health, seems to be six to eight hours. Now, if you are sleeping less than six to eight hours, daytime napping seems to be helping the circadian and the diurnal variations, secretions. If you are sleeping more than six to eight hours, then daytime napping is harmful. Right. I will now skip all these slides, Mr. Chairman, and go to my last aspect. which is air pollution. Is it a emerging risk factor for ischemic heart disease? The data came in 1952 from the London smog, a terrible smog in 1952. And people did not know that patients were dying until the coffin makers in London ran out of coffins. Then they knew we have a problem and the mortality is going up. Now they showed that the death rates, which you see the uh, 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 vertical axis, going up with the amount of smoke and the micro particles in the air. And the data subsequently collected by the American College of Cancer for their purposes indicated that air pollution is associated with ischemic heart disease. Now, 4,000 people were killed in 1952 in four days' time. And why is air pollution causing atherosclerosis or ischemic deaths? It also causes arrhythmias. It is because when you have air pol pol pollution particles of 2.5 to 5 micrometers, you inhale it. We are now interacting with the environment. It goes into our lung. We are inhaling it. And in the lung, we are stimulating the Kupfer cells. The Kupfer cells are now secreting leukotrienes. And we have a leukotrienemia due to the air pollution. In the susceptible person, this leads to accelerated atherosclerosis and this leads to arrhythmias. And therefore, air pollution becomes very important. 
Now, not only, have, and therefore the coronary arteries are all inflamed in the air pollution system. Now, traffic noise is also known. Now, why did I bring up air pollution? Air pollution by the release of leukotrienes from the macrophages in the lung and the leukotrienemia induces endothelialitis. And now we recognize that atherosclerosis is an inflammatory disease of the endothelium and endothelialitis leading to ischemias and arrhythmias. Now, two months ago, the European Society of Cardiology published this billboard. Where have all the myocardial infarctions gone during the lockdown? The answer is blowing in the less polluted wind. During the lockdown, due to corona, in the European territories, air pollution came down. And by a survey in the European Society of Cardiology, they demonstrated that the incidence of ischemic heart disease and myocardial infarction and myocardial deaths have gone down. Here is the map. On top, you see in red the air pollution in the pre COVID era, pre lockdown era, rather. Now, after the lockdown, the air pollution has gone down. And with the reduction in the air pollution, acute coronary syndromes have also gone down. So we have a natural experiment. First in 1952 with the London smog, now in 2020 with the COVID epidemic. And this becomes important to realize that we are not living in a bubble. We are living in an environment, in the physical environment, and the physical environmental health is, has impact on our impact health as well. Recently, I think last week, the high ozone levels were associated with the up cardiac arrest risk with the risk. Now, what are the practical implications of this atherosclerosis and air pollution? If you exercise in a dusty or vehicle congested area, the desired effect of exercise may be lost on you. You may not derive the exercise benefit uh, that you should you expect because the air pollution is causing an adverse effect on the other side. There is a preponderance of heart disease in three-wheeler drivers and masons and people doing breakdowns, etc., and exposed to air pollution because of the cement dust and other dust that come through as an occupational hazard. Police officers working on the streets at risk in Canada and North America, and I suppose the air pollution there is less, dust, less dusty than here. And in this country, too, this concept has to be taken into account. Now, I will skip all this and go. Now, because of all the risk factors that we mentioned, you must remember that the holistic prevention of, a, of preventive cardiologists must be antenatal caregiver. He must be an expert in diabetics. He must be a sleep therapist. He must become a social, social reformer, pain specialist, because pain is now known to cause one cause of ischemic heart disease. An environmental conservationist, a conservatist, conservationist, and a built environmentalist, and a social economist, as well as being well versed in genetics and epigenetics, oxidative and stress biochemistry, and immunology. And the Body Mind Institute of the Harvard Medical School also brings in spirituality, which I have not considered in this lecture. Thank you very much. We will stop. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Very interesting and uh, new insight into preventive cardiology. However, uh, due to the constraints of time, we don't have time for questions and answers, sir. So please, sir, on behalf of the Ceylon College of Physicians, uh, Dr. Anand Vijay Vikram, our president, will hand over the token of appreciation. Thank you very much.